It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Lena Ting. She's faculty in the Wallace H. Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Emory University and Georgia Tech, where she directs the Neuromechanics Lab. She did her bachelor's degree at UC Berkeley and her PhD at Stanford. Um, did postdoctoral training at the Paris Descartes University and Oregon Health and Sciences University. She is truly an interdisciplinary scientist that leverages tools from neuroscience, biomechanics, robotics, simulation, and others. And she's done seminal work on muscle synergies, coordination of posture, motor adaptation, and the list is long. Um, I'm especially excited to introduce her because we actually re just reviewed her papers in my graduate class this week. Without further ado, Professor Lina Singh. Okay, thank you. Um, hope everyone can hear me okay. And I'll, I'm gonna jump into this. It's a, it's, it's interesting. I have done a lot of things that I usually talk about neuromechanics of movement and that um, drove us to start to really try and dig into what muscle spindles are doing because we couldn't explain the balance responses that we're doing. So instead of trying to integrate it all this time, I'm really just going to talk about the muscle spindle, but it's, I think it's like a super interesting and really important sensory system that we're just sort of really learning all the complexities of. So, um, all right. So, you know, a lot of you learned about the muscle spindle and proprioceptive uh, systems. This is the sort of introductory slide of like, how do you know where your arm is when you, when you can't see it? And this is uh, a very, very basic um, and necessary um, sense that isn't covered by your normal five senses, right? So, um, and if you care about moving your limbs around or about robots moving your limbs around, then, then we really need to understand this. So, you know, here's a picture I've been studying it for a long time and it seems like we, you know, know a lot more about other senses. Um, so here's a, you know, I, I talk about a field we've been studying it for over a hundred years. Um, and here's sort of just the anatomy from um, you know, the 1890s of, uh, this is a bunch of striated muscle, um, a skeletal muscle, but in these, in these capsules with all these neurons going in and out of it, right? that are inside the muscle itself. So um, there's a lot of literature on, on muscle spindles. And so I think for a lot of people, it's really hard to get a sense of like, what do they really do? Um, and actually this does not, let me just see where I am. Yeah, okay. So I, I thought I had a slide here that, that's not in this one, but I, you know, I have a lot of conversations with, um, well, I'll do that in a second. So, all right, so this is, the, this is the schematic diagram that you look at when you are like in class, right? And you talk about these muscle spindles as proprioceptive organs in your muscles. And again, they're modified muscles and then they, they lie along the same you know, direction as what we call the extrafusal muscles um, that actually cause the movement and generate the force. Um, and they're in there and they, as I said, they're highly innervated and um, they cause, you know, if you take your neuroscience class, they cause these stretch reflexes or the tendon jerk reflexes, which is the, the most basic, most rapid sensory motor loop that, that we know of, right? And it also goes wrong in lots of neurological disorders. So by understanding the spindle, we'll understand those, those neurological disorders as well. Um, and in parallel, what's talked about much less are these Golgi tendon organs that are kind of at the ends, at the, the junction between the um, extrafusal muscle fibers and the tendon that's now acting on, on the load, right? So th these things are called intrafusal fibers. Um, and, and, you know, we don't know that much about Golgi tendon organs. I'll come back around to that at the end of why, why, I, think they're, why I think they exist. Um, so, you know, there's a, a, the field sort of, there are a lot of old papers about spindles in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and then it kind of slowed down. And I'm seeing a, a resurgence of interest in muscle spindles because of all of the advances in, in neural engineering. So as I said, if you're trying to, you know, put an exoskeleton on somebody and they have this reflex, or you want to know if they can sense the movement, we have to know about the spindles. Um, 
you know, if you're trying to generate a simulation of those reflexes, and we have to have accurate models of what the spindle information is carrying. Um, and so that's a big challenge. Um, you know, if you want to be able to generate a neural prosthesis to um, kind of give somebody uh, who's lost their sense of motion, whether it's in their actual limb or in a, a prosthetic or robotic limb, um, you know, we, we have to understand that as well. So giving sensation um, and knowing what kinds of sensations are our, our devices give or is, is just really, really sort of the, the next barrier, I think, to um, building good wearable devices. So, you know, here's a conversation I have a lot with people where they um, say they're interested in the spindles, but what, you know, because they're trying to build these devices and what, um, what they really mean, not that they're super interested in the biology or anything of the spindles, but they really want to know, like, okay, I just want to read out of what the signals are during my behavior, right? And typically, um, you know, you've got some motion capture and, and, and you're like, okay, tell me, tell me what people are feeling. And so I get this question a lot, like, is it okay to model my muscle spindle signals based on muscle tendon length or velocity? Because that's the easiest thing for us to measure, right? You have like the skeletal motion and you just take the antenna length. And so now you've got this automated video motion capture. Um, I have my simulation. Um, maybe it has muscles, maybe it doesn't have muscles, or I have my, my haptic device. And so my, my answer is really us uh, usually no. And then I get back as like, oh, really? Just as a first approximation. I mean, we're just looking at simple stuff. And, you know, I, I myself have modeled these signals as length and velocity as well, um, because it's, it's uh, the easy thing to do. So I'm like, no, I really believe that we can't do that anymore. And, uh, you know, they ask me like, what, what would I need to know? What, what else? What I need to know. And I start talking about, you know, the extrafusal fibers, the intrafusal fibers, and then the neurons going to it, gamma drive, alpha drive, all these things. And people's, you know, eyes sort of glaze over. And um, mostly things we can't measure, mostly things they've never heard of. And so usually th this is my response or whatever. I'm, I can't listen to you, Lena, I'm going to use muscle length. Um, you know, and it's working for us. So, um, so today I'm going to try and explain like all what all this stuff is and why I think it's important. Um, so, uh, even in the papers, and I agree that if you look in the literature, it's super hard to to understand why, you know, what paper should I read to know what these do. Um, but you know, one thing I'll point out is like there aren't actually any good simulations of like this tendon tap. Um, it's a very impulsive thing. There's barely any length change in that in that tendon when it uh, when you tap on it, and then it generates this huge response. So it's very puzzling. And you know, we were just talking before this at a meeting where we we're trying to simulate it. Um, and the other reason we don't know is that we basically can't measure most of these things <laughs> during movement. Um, oops, sorry. So with new optogenetic techniques and stuff. It's still, we're still not able to measure sort of the afferent signals or, and especially not um, the gamma motor neuron efferent signals that are going to the muscles. So what I'm trying, gonna try and convince you of is that the muscle spindle is not a sensor really, not just a sensor. It's also an actuator and it gets this efferent drive from gamma motor neurons. And they're really tiny motor neurons and like we still don't have good ways of either measuring or manipulating them during movement. There's very, very, very few papers that have that. And there's also very, very, very few papers talking about what the muscle spindle signal is during an actual natural behavior. Okay. Mostly it's like moving people around passively. Um, and the other reason that we need to know about muscle spindle function is that there's a lot of different diseases or uh, that in which muscle spindle dysfunction is implicated. So sensory neuropathy, um, chemotherapy now changes the function of muscle spindles. And then there's these interesting things like soft tissue changes in, uh, in aging actually changes the muscle spindle because you're changing the extracellular matrix, right? So we don't really have a good understanding of why that would be. 
um, in, in muscular dystrophy. Uh, actually, it's not the myosin expression, but there, there's another uh, disease in which the myosins only within the spindles change and then it changes their function. Right. So there's all kinds of things at multiple scales that are changing muscle spindle function. Um, and we don't really know why the most, the most, um, you know, common thing that we think about that I talked to you about is like spasticity and stroke. We know that they're overactive reflexes and that's mostly been considered to be something wrong with the spinal cord processing, but I'm going to argue that it could also be that this, the motor neurons to the spindles are kind of overactive and could also contribute. And that would have big implications for how you treat. So, um, and then, you know, just that line of information coming in is going to affect every other system here that's going to use the information to kind of con perceive and control movement. All right, so here, here's the outline to my talk. I'm going to talk about multi-scale mechanisms of muscle spindle afferent signals. Um, and so the first thing is like, what can we describe about muscle spindle firing and their relationship to all of these different variables? Um, what are the key mechanisms underlying those relationships? And I'm gonna propose that we really take a hard look at the mechanics of that muscle inside the muscle spindle and the force uh, and the yank, which is we defined as the rate, uh, first time derivative of force. Um, as a way to kind of understand all the complexity that we see in muscle spindles and both structurally, these structural changes and sort of functional ones. So we wanted to build a predictive model that incorporated these observations. Um, oh, this, this is published now. <laughs> um, uh, so, sorry, I didn't update these, but this was published in, just at the end of December in uh, eLife. And that has our biophysical multi-scale model there. Um, and then based on that, can we kind of have a richer understanding of what muscle spindles are, are encoding? So, um, so we'll, I'll go through these things as, as we go along. So this took a really long time because I had to get into these muscle spindles. And so I have to credit, like I went back to the University of Paris where I did my postdoc to do some experiments then I had a student, a grad student worked on it um, and uh, got some new collaborators. Ken Campbell is a muscle biophysicist and Tim Cope is a um, spinal cord electrophysiologist. And then I also had a postdoc here, um, Ryan Horslin, who's now at uh, the University of Waterloo, who uh, all, all worked together on, on this sort of crazy project. Um, so, Let's just start from the basics again. I am not, I agree with this statement. Muscle spindles are proprioceptors that respond to muscle stretch. When you stretch the muscle, whether it's like I'm moving the leg um, or with this tendon tap response, you get um, uh, stretching of the fibers. And this is our cartoon of the intrafusal fibers in the spindle. So you see this intrafusal fibers on the end, and then all the cell nuclei are in the middle, and there's a neuron wrapped around it. And this neuron goes here and here. This is called a chain fiber and it's more elastic because the, the cell nuclei are kind of chained together. Um, and this is a bag fiber and it's more viscous. And that's sort of like the, they're floating around like bags of water. So as a mechanical engineer, that's how I think about them. Um, and the, the signals then go to the, you know, go around and cause this, cause this reflex. Um, Here's just a more detailed drawing. So again, the spindles are a complex sensory motor organ and the motor neuron activity, um, so these gamma motor neuron activity, like go to the different parts of this spindle. And this is a simplified spindle that I've shown you here, right? Um, there's what called gamma dynamic motor neuron, uh, uh, which really are related to like really fast transients in, in uh, firing and these like static motor neurons that, um, and then we have, we're gonna talk mostly about 1A afferents and it's a single neuron that wraps around all of these, all of these things. So it's a very complex signal. It's a composite signal to begin with. And then there's these group two afferents right at the junction between the um, 
this sort of encoded region and, and the muscle spindles. And I'm not really going to talk about them as much, but I think my model could, could work on that. So it turns out, like, I think that this activity going to the quote unquote sensor is probably more complex than the alpha motor neuron activity going to act, cause the movement. And that's why we get so much complexity in the, the resulting signals. But I think they're doing really important computations. But let's just take what's in the textbook. So you have a muscle within muscle design. And I think it allows you to integrate this, these commands coming from the central nervous system and all the forces caused on the periphery by your interactions with the environment and with other muscles. So I just went to Kendall and Schwartz and I pulled out like, okay, this is what it looked like. And I put some labels on here, right? So you have your muscles and um, you have activation. So alpha drive to the extensor, alpha drive to the flexor. You have um, a force acting on there, you have inertia, and then you can like move the body and you have length, velocity, acceleration. So in essence, the, you know, that those are all the things that go into um, moving, right? We, we can write equations for the relationships between these things. Um, and then the spindles are embedded all within, let's say one of these muscles, the flexor here. And, um, and then there are just a little repetition of, of that, right? So, and it has, a, it has a particular stiffness. And this is just another way of drawing what I, what I uh, drew before. Um, where we have the group one screw tubes, the dynamic and the static fibers. So here, the muscle spindle, I just wrote this really dumb equation where the, this is the IFR is the instantaneous firing rate. That's one way we characterize the, the number of spikes per, per second coming out of the, the muscle spindle is a function of the length, velocity, acceleration, force, inertia, stiffness of the muscle, alpha drive, gamma drive, two different kinds of gamma drives here. Um, and so changing any of those variables is going to alter the muscle spindle firing. And that's why in certain conditions, we'll see some of these represented and not others. So if I am um, just stretching the muscle and nothing's active, right, then I tend to see um, a change as I, so here's the bottom, I, this is a real classic experiment. I stretch the, the muscle spindle. And up at the top, I, you know, it's just a passive muscle. And, you know, when I get to the new stretch length, it's, it's increased. So I say, oh, it's related to length. Um, this middle part is, looks like, you know, my, my velocity here is just a, a, a box function. And so you kind of get that on top of a ramp. And so that's where this whole force and length idea comes from, this particular context. Um, if I activate here, static guide, static gamma motor neuron. Um, the length change here, I haven't changed anything. All of a sudden this hops up. And so I get, it looks like a change in length, but it's really not. And maybe you could call it a change in sensitivity. Um, but you can also see that sort of the height of this slope here didn't really change that much. And then over here it did. So we, we call that static because it really has to do with the, the tonic firing at a particular length. And if you activate the gamma dynamic, then you get a little bit of change here, um, but it really enhances the um, response during the stretch. And it will have some here. So, so these very mixed mixed signals. Um, in this case, I don't have any, like ha don't have to worry about inertia, don't have to worry about <laughs> forces. Um, but in this condition, um, the, the gamma static and the gamma dynamic are implicated in when people are attending to the stretch. So there's experiments where like, they say, oh, tell me, I'm gonna stretch your ankle and tell me how fast it's going versus how far it's going. And that changes the signal coming out of the muscle spindle, right? So that just means like whatever my mo goals are, are gonna change the gamma drive. And I can preferentially highlight this tonic, you know, how far I went or how fast I went. Okay, if you're shortening, right, and you have an active muscle with, a, was there a question? Um, on a load, um, you know, I'm trying to move my, my arm, then um, I 
usually send, it's thought that you send the same signal to the alpha motor neuron and the gamma motor neuron. But here it's different, right? I don't have any activation. Um, and this is where the idea that the spindle is a little model of the spindle comes and um, what, what the, uh, the gamma drive does is that as I shorten the muscle, that spindle is gonna go slack, right? And so it won't be able to signal anything because it measures tension. So the gamma drive keeps it taut. However, if depending on the, the, the uh, balance here, you could still get firing of the muscle spindle as the muscle is shortening. So that's the really weird thing because we usually think about muscles firing when they're stretching. Um, so again, I don't know what the context of this experiment is, but it's something about like what my goals are, right? So it has to do with the intention, right? Locomotion is like an even more complex task. Um, so you have lengthening and shortening, you have active and passive muscle, you have eccentric and concentric contraction. And um, here, uh, here's the muscle spindle firing and it doesn't really look like the length and not necessarily the velocity. And it's certainly firing here where there's kind of a decrease in the length and maybe no change at all, right? So that's where it gets really complex and I'll talk about that a little more. Um, but you know, here's a recording from a cat walking where you can see, you know, here's the, here's the alpha drive, the, the EMGs, <sighs> and here's the length. And like this firing looks a whole lot like the length, right? However, that's not the muscle spindle afferent signal. That's actually the gamma drive to the, uh, to the muscle spindle. So that, that kind of blew my mind when I saw it because um, the idea is there that that's like a signal of the intention and not of the actual movement. Um, so that's where I think there has to be some internal model of like what I'm trying to do that then sends the, the motor or efferent signals, um, sorry, to the, to the spindle itself. All right, so what, how do we get all of these things to kind of happen in a model? Um, in the experiments that I had done, um, we actually went back and did some very classic experiments where you just stretch a muscle and measure the um, resulting firing rates. So it's like the animals anesthetized, there's no drive, you stick it at an electrode in. So here's the stretch that we had. You stretch, hold, shorten. And um, so we also were able to measure the force of the whole muscle tendon unit. Um, so here's the force. And then here's the yank. So we just take, it's the time derivative, right? And just the thing that I noticed, which wasn't ever reported before, <laughs> surprisingly, was that when I look at the firing rate, so here's the number of spikes per second. This is rasters of like how, when the spikes happen. Um, if you look at the shape of the firing rate over the period of the stretch, this dynamic response here looks really similar to the yank. And then this plateau response looks really similar to this force. So, you know, you can see that when the muscles held at this length here, um, it's still firing and then there's a sort of relaxation, right? And um, if the muscle, yeah, so it's, so it's not really telling me the length that well. So we, we did um, just some modeling. Um, this is like a more data curve fitting model where we recorded the uh, muscle force and yank of the whole, whole uh, muscle and just uh, tried to add them linearly and then put them through a threshold to see if we could predict the muscle firing. And um, we also compared that to a more kinematic model of acceleration velocity uh, and, and length and did the same type of thing, All right? We've done similar things with balance control models and that's, that's actually where it comes from. Um, so here's, here's sort of the short answer is that which of these models reproduces the muscle activity better. And it turns out that when you stretch a muscle right down here, 
five times or two times with the same kinematic profile, um, the muscle spindle fires more the first time than on the second time. And then afterwards, it tends to do about the same thing. So this only happens if the muscle has been sitting there kind of not moving beforehand. Um, and it turns out that, you know, you, here you, I don't have a good encoding of length, right, or velocity, because um, they're the same in the two first and the second stretch. Um, but it turns out that the force is actually much higher. The resistive force of the muscle is much higher the first time you stretch it than the other. This is a property called thixotropy, but it, it just means that we can't treat uh, muscles as, as linear time invariant um, mechanical springs. Okay, so that's fundamentally due to a, a material property of the muscle. And so then if you do these more traditional, you know, ramp, hold, release, you can see that uh, my force related model, force and yank sort of pseudo summation has a really high, you know, it's, it's really accounting for a lot of the details of this. Now, if I, at the same rate, I, I would see like, okay, length and velocity actually does pretty well too, right? And for biology, for R squared of 0.79, I, I would definitely publish that and put my name on it. Um, but as we increase the uh, rate of stretch, the, um, the sort of kinematic model starts to really uh, deviate from the actual firing pattern, whereas our force related model is, um, you know, maintains its fidelity. And in fact, we can fit these three different cases with the same set of, um, you know, gains or model parameters suggesting that we really have a, a relationship that's sort of generalizable across um, different, different contexts. And again, then I'm gonna argue that all of this really reflects the material properties of, of the muscle itself. So um, in case in point, I'm not the first person to point this out. This had been pointed out for many years. They just were not able to record the force and the um, firing at the same time. But um, Richard Nichols and Tim Cope uh, are, were some people to propose that uh, some of these weird non-LTI properties of spindles really are, have to do with um, muscle, muscle short range stiffness. So um, here are, is an experiment that Tim Cope did, which is why he became my collaborator. Again, they just stretched the muscle, spind muscle three times. And you see on this first burst, there's an uh, first stretch, there's an initial burst, and then this ramp, right? So it's a nice velocity signal. However, the slope here on the second one is different. So again, if you're trying to use the spindle to tell you about length and velocity, it's not going to be exactly right. Um, and at the same time, uh, Ken Campbell, who then became my other collaborator, had published this paper, and they had never met till I till I introduced them. Uh, independently, they took a isolated skinned uh, muscle fiber. So it's tiny little muscle fiber. They put it on a little actuator and they stretch it in a calcium bath. And they, they happen to do these very similar types of, of uh, stretches. And what you'll see is the, the muscle itself, when you first stretch it, becomes extremely stiff, almost rigid. Uh, and then the second time it kind of it has a different characteristic. And so, um, you know, so the idea is like, oh, these two things must be based due to the same mechanism. And Ken had developed a model here that also reproduced it. And that model was based on, uh, primarily on the uh, actin-myosin interactions uh, at the muscle fiber level, right? So the idea with short range stiffness is that um, when the muscle is sitting there for a long time, the myosin heads are connected. And then when you pull on them, they have their own stiffness and it, uh, uh, that you have to kind of counteract before the myosin heads pop off. And so right now there's a lot of resistance. And then once you break it, then the muscle becomes much less stiff. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So then we wanted to use that to like then build a predictive model to actually see if we could explain all of these things that I told you about. Um, and that's not something that I thought I would ever do, but it built the Crossbridge model. <laughs> but, but so the hypothesis was that that short range stiffness happens in the extrafusal muscle 
but it also happens in the interfusal muscle. Um, and that's the firing of the, the muscle spindle. So, um, so here's like a really simplified model. We just did two fibers, one's a bag and one's a chain. And um, the bag fiber has a slower myosin, the chain fiber has a faster myosin. And what that means is the bag fiber actually has more short range stiffness because those cross ridges are attaching for much longer before they pop. And um, so, uh, and then we just did a really dumb, you know, hypothesis and said, I'm just gonna take the force and the yank in this, um, in this bag fiber and do my linear and pulled it to get the firing. And the chain fiber, we, we just took the force. Um, it turns out there might be yank, but be, they, not, not a very large um, signal there. Okay. Um, so we did just two state on and off cross bridge model, which is the simplest one. You can do four or five, you probably learned four in class if you did, or there's seven, things like that. So during passive muscle stretch, um, when, we, when we stretch it, um, we assume that the interfusal fiber and the extrafusal fiber change by the same length. So basically the interfusal fiber is just being dragged by the extrafusal fiber. And um, so what we were able to find is that, you know, depending on the gains that we used here, I guess this is switched, like the sensitivity to the force and the yank, we could get firing patterns across this whole grid. So if it's um, very sensitive to yank, then you get these big initial bursts, right? Because that's just the change in force, right? When the force increases. Um, and if you have a lot of sensitivity to force, then um, you have a more prolonged um, activation with the, um, with the stretch. So, you know, these yank based ones are more during the, um, during the stretch and a force relationship is more kind of once you hop up to a new length. So it's sort of like the static and dynamic uh, components I can talk to, talk to you about before. Right, so here, here down here, it just shows this, this sort of ramp and hold stretch. Sorry, I should have talked about that. And the, and the driving potential of the, of the neuron really has two components, one from the bag and one from the chain. So again, the bag has the more, during the stretch, the chain is more kind of how long, how long you are. All right, and then we tuned the muscle so that it would have this history dependence that I talked about. So here, this is kind of a way to test it. It's a little bit different from the other stretches, but we stretched, stretched the muscle once, twice, and then we waited a period of time um, and then stretched it again. And what this showed was that the firing rate here, um, you know, you get this initial burst. Um, so it's not quite a firing rate. It, it, you have to stick it through a neuron to fire, but it's easier to see these continuous curves. Um, so you get a burst, a ramp, and then the second time you stretch it, you get much less firing. And then the longer you wait, the more that initial burst returns. Okay, so if you, if you do it really quickly, the cross bridges haven't reset themselves. And so you don't get that resistance anymore. Um, and then you, you have to wait about 10 seconds for it to come back. But a lot of it comes back by, um, you know, this is a little bit slower than reality. So in reality, it comes back in about one or two seconds. Um, and then it slowly asymptotes. Um, that's probably this figure. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so the data show this sort of asymptotic increase where um, the initial burst, you know, kind of comes back quickly and then kind of keeps going. And ours does the same, but it, it, it takes a little bit, it's a slightly different um, time course. And I think we have to tune our parameters a little bit more. But um, the nice thing is that this property though was sort of emergent from our model. We didn't have to tell it to do this. It was just something that it did. All right, so then based on that, we said, let's just fix these parameters and run all the classic experiments. And here we, um, showed that uh, a bunch of stretch profiles with different velocities um, that we would get these different firing profiles, uh, driving potentials, right? And as, you know, as this slope increases, I get a much larger initial burst. So this is how I characterize it. Initial burst, dynamic index. Um, and um, so one of the things that came out is that this initial burst um, 
goes linearly with acceleration. All right, but I know that it doesn't always follow acceleration. Only in this very special condition of when I've been sitting at rest and I stretch it, does it follow acceleration? Later, it doesn't because we don't see those bursts on the second and third stretches. So this is sort of a, a, a proxy. It's not, a, it's not the real encoding. Um, and then the other is that um, the dynamic index, which is like basically the difference in the firing at the end of the, the ramp and half a second later is how they've done it traditionally. And um, uh, as you increase stretch velocity, that increases, but not linearly. All right, so that's known too. And if you actually want to use velocity as your model of spindles, you have to take that into account too. So our model also had this sort of uh, like power law um, scaling. And again, that was emergent from the uh, cross bridge dynamics. Because that's basically all we have is just like a cross bridge, instead of a bunch of cross bridges in there. And so that was nice to see too, because a lot of the phenomenological models have it in there, but they have to explicitly put in an equation that um, transforms this. Whereas we, we didn't, um, we were just saying that, okay, the biophysics of the muscle causes this. Okay, so the next thing to do was to um, change the, the firing um, with uh, the gamma drive, right? So this is again, just a picture where gamma static um, and gamma dynamic change the way it fires. I went through that, so I'll just skip that. Um, and here, because we have these models, we just changed the number of available kind of binding sites, preferentially on the bag or the chain. Um, and here's some, some results where activating the interfusal fibers, um, again, uh, we can, by activating the bag, we get more increase in the uh, stretch. And by activating the chain, we get more increase on the, on the tonic part. Um, and again, these properties that we got were similar to what was reported um, experimentally before, which just gives us more confidence that we've, we've got the right mechanism. Okay, so what's really interesting is, okay, then we built a model where we actually had an explicit muscle tendon unit and a muscle spindle in parallel with a tendon. Um, and to try and look at these sort of more complex activations, and again, the muscle spindle length is just being dragged by the um, extrafusal fiber, which is connected to a tendon. Okay. And um, so what, what this really demonstrates the fact that these, these kind of different firing patterns depend on um, the, the force and yank in this muscle spindle uh, intrafusal fiber. And I think I have this nice simulation. So the first thing we did ah, is Yeah. All right. Let me let me go over it again. So I'm going to activate the alpha uh, motor neuron only, the gamma motor neuron only, and then both alpha and the gamma. And so when you sort of contract the muscle, right, and you don't have gamma, it goes slack and it stops firing. If you have only gamma, there's no change in the length of either of these, and you'll get firing. And then depending on the ratio of the alpha and gamma, you can get firing or you can get no firing, All right? So that, that's why the gamma drive is so important because you can basically just tune, change the directionality of the firing based on, based on that, all right? Uh, see, I had it there. Um, and, and this helps us explain this really interesting um, idea that like, or observation that when humans produce isometric force, so this is a torque generated. This is in a finger muscle. Um, sometimes, the, uh, so people, you can record from single afferents by sticking a, a needle in your nerve. And um, this discharge rate here is nothing. That's what we usually expect. You're contracting the muscles. Even if it's isometric, the tendon stretches a little bit, right? But in some cases, you actually see that the firing increases. And um, so we were able to show just by changing the ratio of alpha to gamma, we could get the firing of our model muscle spindle to like go negative or, or silence or um, you know increase in this red region. So we could get any range of firing. We could increase it or decrease it with the force 
which um, again, that means I can drive that signal pretty much however I want it. Um, and when you, um, this also changes sort of the precise details of the firing pattern when I stretch in a passive muscle and spindle versus an active muscle and spindle, right? So you'll see here, I get a lot more if the, if the muscle's passive, I get more of a burst when I have um, the spindle active and the muscle silent. And then when they're both active, it's still, you know, um, you know, higher. So I, I need the gamma drive to really give me a nice robust signal, whereas if it's off, kind of doesn't, doesn't really work. All right, so what does that say? Like I, we just had a lot of different um, types of activity and what we really wanna do is understand what, it, what the spindle is trying to tell us, right? So one of the ideas is, okay, is the muscle spindle a physical internal model of muscle body environmental interactions? So here's a model that I like where it says you can't tickle yourself. And so um, the idea is that I like told my fingers to tickle myself and I get sensory feedback, but because in my brain somewhere, I have a neural predictor that says, well, I expect it to be touched. And so these things cancel out and I don't get any tickle signal, right? So that's a called sensory prediction error. And I think muscle spindles do that to some extent, but they do uh, much more than that. Okay, so I have efferent's copy. And so that's kind of similar. Um, so it's more than efferent's copy because it turned out there are beta motor neurons that never get talked about that actually just project to both the extrafusal and the interfusal. So those allow you to send the same signal to the spindle and the muscle, which is this efferent's copy thing, which is how we think about all these internal models. But you also have the gammas. And, and so if gammas don't have to follow alpha, why should they? And I already showed you some cases where they don't, right? Um, that gives me this whole tuning of like, what, what information do I really want from the world? I can, I can influence that from, from my uh, goals and, and intentions. So, so when you think about the, the, so the spindle sort of acts as this box here, but it's actually not in neurons. It's actually just a physical model of that, right? So it's allowing you to cancel out forces that I expect from my motor commands from the ones that happen in the exterior world. And as a, as a analogy, I like to think about um, flies, fly halter systems, um, because it really kind of, to me, um, makes the separation sort of more clear. So the flies have wings that they fly with and they have little wings that they sense with. And these halteers also receive appearance copy just like the spindles and they flap during flight, but they don't produce any propulsive force. And um, so what happens if, you know, if you have a gust of wind or something, you know, that, that halteer is gonna sense it and it actually sends a reflex right back to the wing to change it. And it also changes with descending control. So like visual input or whatever will change the way that the little wing flaps uh, slightly differently than the big wing. And so I think the same exact thing is happening in, in the muscle spindle. So it's a very complex system. And so it's doing, it's not just sensing, it's doing computations um, to get the right information um, from the world. And so this is the figure we just drew where you know, we have motor commands that go to the both the uh, extrafusal and interfusal. And then we have these gamma motor neurons that are reflecting like central state. Like our goals, emotions, attention, all change the nature of the information that's, um, that's, that comes out. And um, let's see what I have. And so gamma static, I showed you at the beginning, looks like the joint angles. And so it probably, you know, the motor command doesn't tell me the joint, the EMG doesn't tell me the joint angle, but somehow there's this expectation of a joint angle. And by like moving, you know, giving a command to the, to the spindle that follows it, it's likely that that means it doesn't fire when I follow the correct joint angle. And it will fire as soon as I have some force here, like an object or a load or an obstacle that keeps me from being able to follow that trajectory. Okay, gamma dynamics is a whole different story. It, uh, it turns on like just before heel strike. And so I think it gives me that huge burst when I actually touch an object, right? That's super important to know. So it's not just movement 
error where I, you know, I don't want a signal. Lots of times I have purposeful interactions and I want the signal of when I need to change from, uh, let's say kinematic to force control, from motion control to force control. And that's what happens when you like, you know, touch the ground or an object. So here's our like box diagram of the system where you kind of have alpha drive, beta drive and gamma drive, the intrafusal fibers, a little model of the extrafusal fiber. Um, and then when it, um, it receives motion back from body mechanics, right? Both of them change the same length. And then I get this encoding. We're calling this muscular X afferents, which means that it canceled out the expected movement and it gives me signals on what happened out in the world. Um, whereas the Golgi tendon organ is sitting in the tendon here and we call that muscle muscular reafference. Uh, that tells me what the force is that I actually cause in my muscle. So we think this is more about muscle contractile force. And so I basically have these two signals one that tells me what the external world did to me and one that tells me what I did to the world. Um, and so just through, through locomotion, we can see all the different roles where, um, you know, you get in swing, passive much stretch, and that's where the classic length velocity thing comes in. Heel strike, you've got dynamic right before you touch. So I get a super robust signal when I touch because that's a really, really critical time. And I need to know when it happens. <laughs> um, and then after that, I'm gonna monitor that eccentric power transfer, right? That's, this is also a very critical period of time when I need good sensory feedback um, to monitor what's going on. It's not, as opposed to kind of later in stance, it's more ballistic and okay, fine. You're gonna go off in a different angle, um, but you're, you're not gonna fall. Um, and then again, throughout the time, sense deviations from the expected trajectory and then in the nervous system, we need these signals going from locomotor pattern. So the reason I'm, I'm highlighting this is if, um, if it was just sensory prediction error, it would mean that if everything goes right, I would have no sensory signals. But here it's like, I want the sensory signals with the environment. Um, most of that sensory prediction error is most about like moving your arm around in space where the, there's no context with, with the world. But, um, all right, so that's that's where I think that the 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 muscle spindles are sensory motor signals, and they're computing, um, allowing us to compute like what uh, movement error, you know, interaction with the environment, and then tuning this system based on what it is I need to know about the environment. Um, so. I, and that's sort of the end of, of the talk. And I know we have a few more minutes for question, but like, I think moving forward, trying to incorporate this is gonna be really, really important for kind of designing all kinds of um, biologics to exoskeletons and other things to, to help treat and restore movement. Um, and so with that, I'm just gonna thank my lab uh, and my funding. And if people are interested in uh, coming to Georgia Tech Emory for a PhD, we, we do have a training program in computational neural engineering. Thank you, Leonardo. That was a fantastic talk. Um, do people want to kind of raise their hands or unmute themselves and ask questions? People, maybe I'll start. Or people um, things at chat in the chat too. Yep, okay. Or the chat, yeah, that's great. So it says, has the hammer knee reflex like being tickled at a muscle tendon level? Sure, it's an unexpected external force. So when we're not doing anything, then yeah, it's really is when the muscle spindles most like this idea of, um, you know, a passive length force sensor. And, and I'll say, so that force, the, the time when I showed you the data about the force being encoded of the whole muscle, that is only in this passive sort of condition. And so that does hold when you're when you're doing the you know tendon tap, and uh, you know you're not trying to uh, do do a movement. Great, that was going to be my next question. Thanks. Sure. I'm going to stop the share so I can just be on the screen unless people want to mm -hmm. question. So I have a question. So did you analyze like models that have jerk? Kind of compared with yank. So I'm sort of interested in the sort of difference between those kind of linked by Newton's second law. So you could say that, you know, jerk is 
you know, similar to Yank, and maybe that would be sort of a more descriptive term or more consistent with the traditional descriptions of muscle spindles that can consistent with force. Length. Yeah, unfortunately, like it doesn't work because of um, it's really about the muscle properties. So force, so Yank and jerk are equivalent in an inertial system, F equals MA. However, they're not equivalent in a, a viscous system, right? Mm -hmm. And they're off or in a elastic system. So I think the spindles are more elastic and viscous. Um, and so it's a little bit different. The other is that the yank really shows up during the short range stiffness. Um, and the acceleration dependence that I saw, as I said, it only held during this, this sort of initial period of, of stretch. And later times you do have muscle acceleration where you don't mm -hmm. have a very large yank and you, and you don't see the signal. Um, um, it sort of parallels our, yeah. So the yank ends up being more like the acceleration signal that we see mm -hmm. rather than a jerk signal. Got it, okay, that's helpful. That's a really like interesting model representation of a spindle. Yeah. Like, um, Brian has a question mm -hmm. in the chat. Brian. I see Brian's question. What elicits gamma firing before heel strike rather than right after heel strike? Well, so right before heel strike is the period that neuroscientists refer to as E1, um, which is when the extensors are on prior to um, heel contact. So this is all uh, in, in anticipation. So this is where I think a central pattern generator is like an internal model where you're expecting a, um, a ground contact. You need it to happen. And so you turn on both the extensor muscles before that, as well as um, you know, uh, increase the sensitivity of the spindles so that you have very good information about when you hit it, as well as the muscles activated so that it can begin to absorb the, the impact, right? So that's, um, that's where like, I know there are reflex-based locomotion models, but they're not necessarily the way that we walk. Um, having seen some data from people with spinal cord injury, um, it looked like their, you know, their sensor activity looked kind of normal, but then I noticed it was like totally shifted till after um, heel strike. And that's when, um, you know, you w see people with them impairments and they're really have these huge impacts with the ground, right? Because they're not prepared for, for that. And then that causes a reflex and they're able to sustain gait, but it's not the most efficient or kind of smooth way to do that. So when you look at someone's gait, you can kind of say, oh, they're, they're not anticipating. They're walking more reflexively rather than in a um, kind of using a, a anticipation of that. I have a question that kind of follows up to that, which would be like, have people begun or have you begun thinking about how like this type of spindle model might be represented in sort of a reflex-based controller? Um, just me so far. <laughs> I think the problem is, you know, and our model actually kind of isn't that great right now. Um, we're having some issues with the shortening and stuff. So I think what we've shown is that in principle, you know, we need these things to be able to get these, these nice bursts that are really important for these contact events. So any kind of object manipulation or whatever, you're going to need it. Um, and so we still need to tune it to be kind of really predictive of, of movement, but we have done some simulations with it that we're kind of still working on. Uh, we're starting with this pendulum test for spasticity where uh, we published some models from based on phenomenological models where we had incorporated short range stiffness phenomenologically and demonstrated that we absolutely needed it to explain um, the abnormalities. And people have tried over the years. So the pendulum test, you like stick out your leg, your knee and you drop it and it swings. And so it looks like this nice second order system, except that that first swing is smaller than the second swing sometimes, which you know can't happen in your spring mass damper system. And so, um, so we were able to um, account for that with just these two dependencies on force and yank if we had this nonlinear you know, muscle property. And um, you know, over the years, people had tried to model it with uh, just velocity feedback. And that's our, we usually say spasticity is increase in velocity dependent reflexes. And I did it for a homework problem and like we couldn't get it to work. 
Um, and it turns out people have done all kinds of things like changing their games every half oscillation or something like that, um, sort of as a, as a hack. Um, and so we think we got like more mechanistic um, there. But yeah, we're, that's our goal is to do that next. Very cool. Looks like Varun is a, a comment in the chat. Our similar, more reflexive anticipatory behaviors also seen in healthy people walking the stabilizing force field. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of destabilizing force field experiments. Um, I, I think when people, and if they know that it's destabilizing, they'll be more anticipatory, but in the, in the context of stability like that, it, it usually shows up as like muscle coactivation. Right, and so that's a, a condition where you are, you know, ostensibly changing the stiffness of the joint, and then what it means is that you don't have to rely on sensory information as much to stabilize because you're just relying on the intrinsic stiffness of the muscles, and even if you get your feedback wrong, you've got stiffness of the muscles so that you, you know, you don't have to. So I, usually, I think of people using co-contraction when they don't have good sensory motor control. Either they can't sense or they can't activate. Um, but it, it, it raises a question uh, that I don't know the answer to, that I don't think anyone knows the answer to is does coactivation increase or decrease the amount of sensory information you get during, you know, during a perturbation? Um, our modeling suggests that when the muscles are on, like you get less, but it could be if you turn on more gamma drive, you could get more. And so that's an open question. Are people co-contracting to get more information or to get um, be more stable or both? All right, any more questions? Oh, there's one. A real space approach to assess related Firing the other known approach is essentially kept the same basic physics and on. So, what is a real space approach? Mean? Um, a kinematic approach. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to take into account this, this, these pro properties of the of the muscle. Right, because kinematics basically comes from forces plus material properties, and so kinematics. There's a there's a really famous paper. Not not sorry, not a famous one of my favorite papers about movement. Um, and the, the last sentence is called "Kinematics happens." That was, you know, kinematics is not causal; it just happens um, because of loads and because of forces. So I think. Sticking at the kinematics level is is sometimes problematic for that reason because you can get the same kinematics for different um, underlying causes. Um, you know, the model we have is like ten thousand cross bridges, and so there is another model by uh, Zahalik where they're estimating these distributions of these cross bridges, and so we're with Friedel de Groot um, are playing around with that a little bit just to have a simpler formulation, but it's still a model of these changing material properties of the muscle. All right, going once. What? Twice. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you uh, one more time. Thank you, Lena, for a wonderful talk. Great. Thank you. Um,